All right, easy peasy, I think we're rolling. So welcome everyone to PS Platypus week seven. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of stuff for you guys uh, today, so we'll try and get through it efficiently. Uh, and we'll st be starting off with lower limb three, the continuation of everything uh, that you guys have been going over so far. Um, and yeah, we'll get it right into it. So in terms of the osteology, uh, the foot is going to be a lot more complicated uh, than the leg has been up till now. Um, so obviously we've gone from just having the femur, the tibia and the fibula to having a lot of bones. Um, it is helpful though to remember that the sort of foundations and the overall plan of this um, is quite similar to the hand. So you can sort of think of the foot as a freakishly mutated hand. Um, so our tarsals, instead of being... Um, a very nice little uniform bunch like they are in the hand with the carpals um, are now much more different. So we have the talus right at the uh, at the ankle joint. Um, we have the calcaneus right below it. Uh, and then we have, so those are sort of the two really big ones. Um, they sort of stand on their own. They're sort of independent of the breast. Um, and then we have um, sort of the conventional group of tarsals, the little bones right there. Um, so you can see them there. There are the navicular and the cuboid stand on their own and then there's the cuneiforms which have the same name um, and they're just literally named as to whether they're more lateral or medial um, so if any of you guys get the name wrong on that i will be very disappointed um, and then again we have pretty much the same um, plan as the fingers so instead of going to um, metacarpals we then go to metatarsals um, and then finally we have phalanges um, and again it's going to be distal, middle, proximal, and in the um, the big toe, the hallux, um, we're only going to have distal and proximal. Um, so yeah, this should be really familiar for you guys um, because it's it's basically stuff you've done before, but in a different context. Um, now over to the left, there's a bit of stuff with the ligaments, which is going to be important um, later, especially for clinical um, purposes. So uh, I want to draw your attention mainly to the ligaments supporting the ankle joint. Um, so on the left hand, well, I had to say left hand side, this is the right foot being shown in medial and, and uh, lateral view. So in the on the medial side of the foot, you can see the deltoid ligament. So that's like four parts, which join into one big ligament um, going from the tibia uh, to various parts of the, the foot, basically. And on the right side, um, we don't have a big web of ligament like that. We instead have a bunch of smaller ligaments, which I think I go into a little bit more detail on with the next slide, oh, sorry, the one after this one. So before we get to that, we'll talk about a bit of clinical relevance. Um, so there are lots of different ways to break your foot. Um, when we have an ankle fracture, the most common place for that to happen is your fibula. Um, and the reason for that is pretty clear cut. It's just the thinnest and the weakest bone in that region. Um, and therefore it's sort of the weakest point. So if you have a force on your foot, um, it's most likely to be dissipated by breaking of the fibula um, as opposed to be, uh, being broken, by, sorry, dissipated by breaking of the tibia or something else. Um, so if a force is strong enough to break your tibia, um, it should probably already have broken your fibula. So that's why we, we typically get a patient come in with just that. Um, so there are different ways we can classify ankle fractions. They're all listed there. Um, and really, like, I want to encourage you guys to think systematically wherever possible. So, um, in type A fractures, um, we are on an in inverted foot. So you're, you're sort of the, the sole is facing medially. Um, and then you get an adduction force. Um, and what that's going to do is then pull the, um, the fibula away. So th there's going to be a bunch of ligaments tugging on the fibula, uh, which means that when the, uh, the break does happen, it happens like below that little bulge, basically, the, the tibia fibula syndesmosis. If instead we have, again, the foot's inverted, um, so we have uh, the sole facing medially, but then there's external rotation in the other direction, um, the force is then um, strongest. Instead of being a pull force, it's now a sort of a push force or a crush force, um, and then we're going to break at the tibia fibula syndesmosis. Um, and finally, if your sole is instead facing laterally, you're externally rotated, um, then we break even higher. Um, because the force is again moving in a different direction. Um, you can see there the little red lines, those little ligaments, um, and that's sort of showing you um, that we typically get um, ligamentous breakage uh, when stuff like this happens. Um, so of these, type A is actually pretty stable. Um, so we don't typically get an unstable joint from a type A fracture. Uh, B and C, we do get an unstable joint. 
Um, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. Um, and finally, C, because we're breaking, <clears throat> sorry, um, because we're breaking so many things um, close together and we're also um, <clears throat> breaking them in certain places, uh, we get what we call a widening of the tibiofibular articulation. Um, so it sort of becomes more expanded and things aren't in contact anymore, which is- um, Wait, like James. Yeah. Um, did you say B and C were unstable? Right. Uh, yes. Yep. yes Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, easy peasy. Um, uh, then we have the POTS fracture. So the POTS fracture is sort of just stuff gets messed up. Um, it's a, quite a violent fracture compared to our little ankle fractures up the top. Um, and so we'll typically get um, fracture of the lateral and, and middle um, malleolus um, and also the posterior malleolus of the tibula. And that's basically when you, so again, you're everting, so your sole is facing laterally, um, and you have even more um, force on that. So it's going further than what your body can actually handle. Okay, um, so let's talk joints. So the first joint, uh, so your ankle joint is actually two joints, I want to make that clear. Um, and each of them handles slightly different things, um, at least primarily. So your talocrural joint um, is the actual, is like the top of your the ankle joint. And the one that we typically think of as the ankle joint. Um, so this is between your tibia uh, and your talus, which is like the top bone of your foot. Um, and this is a hinge type joint. So it goes forward, it goes backwards. It sort of rotates like that. Um, it's, so the only movements that it really um, is responsible for are dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Those are the main ones. Um, so immediately, like I said, we have that really big fat ligament, the deltoid ligament. Um, and it's made well, for small ligaments in of itself. And so it's more of a complex. Um, and laterally, we have three other ligaments and they're a lot smaller um, and a lot more disparate. So we have the posterior and anterior talofibula um, and the calcaneofibula. Um, I think the posterior uh, talofibula is not um, shown in that diagram for whatever reason. Um, good thing about ligaments, very often they're named just for the two bones that they go between. Um, so that's a very easy way of remembering them. Okay, um, and so again, like I said, when we have an ankle fracture or we have a dislocation, typically we have ligament damage on the opposite side. Um, so again, you can understand why that happens just by thinking about it systematically. Um, like when we have a, uh, a valgus or a virus stress in the knee, if the, um, the ligaments are called on to stretch further than they can actually stretch, um, they're gonna break at some point. Um, so in the same way, if we have a, a, a forced e version, you're likely to break um, the, the fragments on the, the fragments, the ligaments on the lateral side, uh, if you have a forced inversion, um, sorry, yeah, inversion, lateral side, eversion, medial side. Um, and it's harder to break on the medial side because it's, it's just bigger and fatter. Okay, um, so this is the second part of the ankle joint. So we talked about the first part, that's the dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Um, and then now we're gonna do inversion and E version, basically. Um, so this one is a plane type joint, it's not a hinge, and it's a synovial joint, it's got synovial fluid all through it. Um, so if you look in there on the right, you can see the, the main articulations there. Um, so it's, it's not exclusively between the talus and calcaneus, but that's the main, um, main joint there. And there's a little ligament between them, um, which keeps them together and prevents them from getting too far apart, basically. So a subtalar dislocation is where we break um, the, oh, sorry, we disrupt um, usually both the talocrural and talonavicular joints. Um, in the, um, the, there are two different ways for it to happen. Um, and the one that we typically get, uh, which is shown there, is a medial dislocation, basically. Um, why does that happen? Because the lateral malleolus on the fibula um, if you look at the diagram on the top, you can kind of see immediately why it's like that. Because if you try to move laterally, um, you're stopped by the, um, the fibula, basically. If you try to move medially, you have a bunch of ligament um, protection, but that is not the same thing as bone protection, um, and it's less strong. Um, so the vast majority, um, I think it's like 65 to 80% of, uh, of subtalar dislocations, they come in um, as medial. Um, and so if you see a patient presenting like that, that's probably what they've got. Um, and because lateral dislocations have that sort of block against them in the, uh, in the fibula, if they do happen, uh, it means there was more force and that can uh, lead to an open wound. And that has its own complications, obviously. 
All right. Um, other ways to fracture your foot, we have many weird and wonderful ways to injure yourself. So talus fractures um, is a fracture of that top bone. So remember that is the main articulation between your foot and your leg. Um, so there can be potentially a lot of force going through that, which can lead to problems. Um, so it's most likely to break at the neck, um, which is where you basically, you dorsiflex too far for whatever reason. Um, and the breakages at the body or the head, head is like the least off from what to happen. Um, when you break at the body, um, which is a bit sort of like right under the, the actual um, talocrural joint, um, that typically happens uh, when you like, for example, you jump up and down uh, a lot. And so you, you put a lot of force through the talocrural joint um, and the, the point um, where that force is concentrated is the head. Um, so because of the way the, the arteries are, are um, distributed in that particular region, um, you can cause avascular necrosis. So that should not remind you of like femoral head and that sort of thing. Um, and then calcaneal fracture. So cal calcaneus bone right under the talus. Um, and there are two different types of, of um, fracture. It's a little bit opaque what the difference is, but it's very simple once you understand. It's basically, does the fracture include um, the places where the calcaneus articulates with other bones. So in number one there, um, you can see that the fracture is away from the actual joint, uh, whereas in two, there's a branch of the fracture which goes under the, um, uh, the joint between the, the talus and the calcaneus, basically. Um, so that's literally it. So if it, uh, the fracture or the crack uh, affects the part of the bone which is involved in the joint, it is a uh, intra-articular fracture. If it doesn't involve any part of the bone involved in the joint, it's an extra-articular fracture. Um, and so, yeah, that can affect walking partially because you have a lot of, um, of ligaments and things connecting to the calcaneus. And also because um, if you have an intra-articular fracture, um, it's gonna make it more painful to walk because the force is being transmitted through that joint and through that part of the bone. All right. So again, so talking about all those ligaments, we have a bunch of pathologies um, to do with them. So an ankle sprain, you guys probably know how those work. Uh, we have different types. So one is like a very small lesion. Um, two is we have a partial tear. Um, three is we have a full tear um, of a ligament in the ankle. Um, again, we typically get inversion. So we talked about it. Um, we typically get medial dislocation. We typically get an inversion sprain um, because uh, we have, a both a, a stronger deltoid ligament um, and a uh, and and bony guards against it. So there's a lot more going for um, uh, the medial. Sorry, how do I say? There's a lot more protecting your foot when it everts um, than when it inverts. Basically, um, so it's it's a much less protected movement, and so we get more um, injuries while it happens. Uh, your Achilles tear. Um, that's when you dorsiflex too much, so up like that. Um, so that stretches the Achille and it can, um, it can actually break the Achille if there's too much force through it. Um, so patients say it feels like getting shot. I don't know what getting shot feels like, so that's not super helpful to me. Um, but if someone comes in and, and tells you it felt like that, then maybe check their foot. Um, the, the presentation, you can see a really good image on the, the bottom right there. Um, it's the one with the, the two feet hanging over a, like an inspection bench or something. Um, so the two things I want to draw your attention to, so you can see the foot on the right, the foot is sort of partially um, uh, plantar flexed, right? So that's the natural position of your foot. Um, the one on the left, it's sort of hanging freely. Um, and so it's uh, th because the natural position is slightly plantar flexed, we can call that dorsiflex. Um, the other thing you can see, like the back of the foot is really smooth. Um, so that's another thing that you can see there. So if a patient comes in like that, um, and they also don't have an ankle jerker reflex, um, then you should probably be considering um, an Achilles tear. Pes planus and pes carvus, so it just means flattened high arch foot, they're the fancy name for them. Um, pes planus is caused by um, the spring ligament, which is a little one right on the underside of the foot, the plantar side of the foot. Um, which is between the navicular, one of those tarsal bones I mentioned, um, and the calcaneus. Um, so that spring helps keep them curved basically. And if it fails, um, then you can end up with a flat foot. Um, so instead of being in a nice arch, there you can see like white, yellow, blue, green form a nice arch. Um, if that breaks, um, then you can end up with a flat foot instead, which makes walking a lot worse. Um, Pez carvus has a lot of different um, uh, causes, but they're not super high yield. 
have a brief point on that ankle sprains as well. Um, back to the first pathology on that previous slide. Um, yeah, I think another reason, aside from the deltoid ligament being stronger and having those bony guards, is our center of gravity. So because we're sort of standing, if we start um, rolling our ankle inverted, um, then we don't we we aren't able to actually catch ourselves with our other leg. Whereas if we start everting our foot, we can sort of catch it on the other leg. So there's more opportunity for that sort of um, exaggeration of the the inversion of the ankle. Yeah. So like everything is stacking up basically for your foot to mess itself up in inversion rather than eversion. Um, yeah. So don't blame it if it's going through a lot. All right. So extrinsic muscles of the foot. Um, I think these were covered mostly last week, so I'm not going to go too much in detail through them um, for the sake of avoiding repetition. Um, but suffice it to say, if it is dorsal, it's probably going to be dorsiflexing the foot. Surprise, surprise. Um, and it's probably also going to be um, extending the toes. Um, if it's posterior, so in the posterior um, compartment of the leg, um, it will then go to the plantar side of the foot and it will do the opposite. The plantar flex the foot um, and it will flex the toes. Lateral, we only have a few muscles and we have no medial. So the lateral ones are going to slightly evert the foot, basically. Um, so you'll see a lot of those tendons going into the foot. Um, same thing as the hand. That's the general idea. Um, you'll see a lot of them going in um, and, and messing with things, basically. Um, but yeah, you, we mostly covered that last week, so I won't spend too much time in it. One thing I will, I will note um, is if you have something called per perineal uh, nerve palsy, I'm almost positive I pronounced that wrong. Um, we mentioned this, I think, briefly last week. Um, but if you think about it, the anterior compartment of the leg is going to give you a lot of your um, dorsiflexion power, the same way that the posterior compartment of your leg is going to give you a lot of your plantar flexion power. These are the main um, like motors behind those movements because it's just so, they're so much bigger um, and they're so much stronger. <laughs> Excuse me. So if you get perineal nerve palsy, um, that paralyzes the anterior compartment of, of your foot, which means you can't dorsiflex as well anymore. So instead, your natural state is now pulling down. And so you get foot drop where you are excessively plantar flexed under normal conditions, basically. Uh, yeah. And that makes walking harder. So if, like, the, if you look at a patient when they come in, they'll like be dragging their foot, basically. <coughs> Excuse me. I should probably not have covered. Um, so in terms of intrinsic muscles of the foot, we'll start with the dorsal side because it is much easier because there are many less muscles. Um, there are only really two of them. Um, so the extensor digitorum brevis, um, which is toes two to four, um, and extensor hallucis brevis, which is toe one, big toe. Um, and so they're going to provide fine control as opposed to the counterparts in the anterior compartment of the leg, uh, which will do the same movement, um, but will uh, be more coarse control basically. So there are no intrinsic um, dorsiflexors of the leg, uh, of the foot, sorry, excuse me, um, because you can't pull the foot closer to the leg like that uh, if you're in the foot. So yeah. Um, okay, plantar level, um, oh, sorry, the plantar side is a lot more complicated, so we'll take it a little bit slower. So we have four layers that we think about. Um, and that's how I want you to, to sort of organize your thought um, when it comes to this. So on the most superficial layer, that's the left, um, we have three muscles of concern. Um, so on the, um, the lateral and medial sides, we have the abductor hallucis, big toe, um, and then the abductor digi minimi. Um, so that's where they're gonna get the most um, traction basically to pull those, those toes out wide. Um, in the middle, we have the flexor digitorum brevis. Um, and that's connected to the calcaneus, um, your heel, by the plantar aponeurosis. Um, the, uh, the second layer, when we go slightly deep to that, we then have the flexor digitorum longus, although obviously the full muscle is in um, the leg. So now it's just the tendon. Um, the quadratus plantar is quite interesting. Um, basically, it's a muscle which contracts with the flexor digitorum longus because the longus... Um, yeah, sorry, it's, it's tendon runs along the side of the foot because it needs to sort of duck under um, the, the medial side of the foot and will go over like uh, the, the, um, 
the canal that it goes through in just a second because it has a whole bunch of important um, uh, tendons and other components. But because it's going through on the medial side, it's diagonal by the time it gets to the foot. That is not really particularly good. So we don't want your feet to be moved, like your toes to be moving um, side to side when we're trying to just um, uh, flex them. So we have a whole muscle in the foot um, whose purpose is just to try and make that more straight. So the, the, the power is sort of provided by the flexor digitorum longus uh, and then quadratus plantae sort of guides that in a useful way. Um, and then we have the lumbricals stuck on there as well. Again, this should seem pretty familiar from the, from the hand stuff. Um, deep to that, we have the flexor hallucis brevis, um, the flexor digiti minimi brevis. So you can again see just on both sides, you have the counterparts. Um, and then you have the adductor hallucis, which has two heads. So one um, goes obliquely to the middle of the, the sole, um, and the other one goes to the other side of the, uh, the sort of distal sole, as it were. Um, the final layer uh, is the dorsal and plantar interossei. Um, so the dorsal interossei are going to mostly um, abduct uh, the, the toes, uh, whereas the plantar interossei are mostly going to adduct the, the toes. Um, and they don't all work on all the, the toes. So dorsal um, is like two, three, four. Um, plantar is like three to five, because uh, five has its own abductor, for example. All right, uh, these are just some summary tables, general ideas. Um, one thing I haven't talked about yet is the deep fibular nerve, uh, sorry, the, the innervation of, of these. So the extensor digitorum brevis dorsally, um, I don't know why it doesn't have the other one, um, is innervated by the deep fibular nerve um, on the, the dorsal side. Um, and the on the sole, we typically have the medial and lateral plantar nerve. So we'll talk about those more um, when we go through overall innervation of the foot. Okay, so this is the tunnel I was talking about, the tarsal tunnel. Uh, this is quite um, high yield because you get a lot of pathologies um, through the tarsal tunnel. It's also just a, a good, important bit of, bit of anatomy. Um, so we have a mnemonic for it. It's Tom, Dick, and very nervous, naughty, neurotic Harry. Um, you can pick whatever N word you like. Uh, no, you can pick most N words. Few you should avoid. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, the thing that it stands for, uh, the tibialis posterior tendon, that's our T, um, the flexor digitorum longus tendon, um, which is our D, the posterior tibial artery, and then the vein, uh, and then the tibial nerve, um, and finally the flexor hallucis longus. So you can sort of think of, of why these things would be in that order. Um, the tibialis and flexor are, are sort of going further, um, whereas the, the hallucis is, um, uh, Sorry, that's not right. The, the tibialis and the flexor digitorum longus are deeper, um, whereas the flexor hallucis is, um, is a, bit more, a bit more superficial. And so it can afford to be closer to the sole, basically. Um, yeah. So the, the boundaries of this tarsal tunnel are basically the medial malleolus of the tibia. Um, you can see part of the, tar the talus um, forms the wall as well. Um, and then you can, you can find sort of the curve of the, the calcaneus as it sort of bulges out towards the end, that forms the other part. Um, the main, like the main uh, border, I guess, the main cover for this um, is the flexor ret retinaculum. Um, so this should, again, feel a little bit familiar um, and it should feel even more familiar when we go through the pathology, which is tarsal tunnel syndrome. Um, so we get compression of the tibial nerve in the tarsal tunnel. Um, there's lots of different reasons it could happen. They all lead to sort of um, narrowing of the tarsal tunnel, which means we have more likely, uh, we're more likely to get compression. Um, so we get altered sensation in the sole of the foot because that's the area that the tibial nerve gives off sensory fibers to. Um, and we can get weakness um, or even in extreme cases wasting uh, because it also, it also supplies um, the intrinsic muscles of the foot. Um, if we need to um, treat it surgically, um, we cut the flexor retinaculum to relieve the pressure, basically. Um, so yeah, it should remind you of something in the hand. Can anyone tell me what it reminds us of in the hand? Any ideas, anything similar that we can think of? Perhaps with the equivalent name for the hand. Oh, 
All right, we're shy today. It's 10 a.m. on a Monday. That's fair. Um, oh, yep. No, we got, we got an acronym there from Anjan. Uh, CTS, which I assume stands for the thing that I'm probably developing, carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, so it's basically the same idea. Again, it's literally the same name, just with carpal tarsal. So you're, you should um, you should know by now, tarsals are the foot equivalent of carpals. Um, and this is the foot equivalent of the carpal tunnel. Um, so again, we have um, a canal, which is mostly covered um, by the large, a large bit of ligament, basically. Um, and when we compress the nerve inside, we get paresthesia, we get potentially muscle wasting, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's very, very similar pathology to the carpal tunnel. Awesome. Um, okay, so arterial supply of the lower leg um, is basically like predicated on two major arteries. So the popliteal artery um, splits into the posterior typical artery and the fibular artery. Um, both of them supply parts of the uh, lower leg. The fibular artery supplies most of your lateral muscles. Um, the PTA supplies most of your posterior muscles. And in the front, we have the anterior tibial, tibial artery, um, which, uh, which supplies most of your anterior compartment. So if we then um, go down into the foot, the two main arteries are again the anterior and posterior tibial, sorry, anterior and posterior tibial artery. Um, and we have a slight bit, of, like we have a little bit of, uh, of contribution from the fibular artery, uh, which shouldn't be discounted because there's still some important stuff there. So if we get, yeah, if we zoom in a little bit to the foot, um, you can see again, the anterior tibial artery is gonna be there at the front. Um, it sort of goes down the dorsum of the foot um, and it becomes the dorsalis pedis artery. Um, the posterior uh, uh, tibial artery is gonna go around the back and go again through that tarsal tunnel um, to the sole of the foot. Um, so if I go and pick the next slide, yeah, um, these are the more detailed ones. So we can follow the path of each artery in turn. So on the, um, the plantar side, uh, we have the posterior typical artery. It's going to branch into the lateral and medial plantar ar arteries. Sorry, arteries. Um, the medial one is a lot smaller because um, it, it supplies less of the foot, basically. Um, and then that's mostly um, dedicated to the big toe, um, although it contributes to um, the, the sort of the plantar, the digital arteries of the, the plantar side, basically. Um, the lateral plantar artery is a lot fatter because um, it has more places to, um, to support. And it basically goes and it, it goes down and it arches around and it actually anastomoses with the dorsalis pedis, which we'll see in just a second on the dorsal side. Um, at the plantar arch, okay? Um, so if we then look at the dorsal side, again, we have the anterior tibial artery, and then it goes down, down, the dorsal of the foot becomes the dorsal, dorsalis pedis, which is listed there as dorsal artery of the foot, same thing, um, just in Latin versus English. Um, and then it's gonna give off um, the arcuate artery, which is gonna form the, the dorsal version of that arch, um, among other arteries. So it gives off um, lateral and medial versions of the anterior malleolus up the top, and then the tarsal, tarsals um, further down. So it sort of gives off to both sides, like a sort of branching tree. Um, and you can see there, there's a little tiny little bit of it that sort of ducks underneath uh, into the, uh, like below the toes basically, and that's gonna be the bit that anastomoses. So it's between um, the uh, metatarsals of the palate, the big toe, um, and of the second digit. So it sort of slips down there and anastomoses. And so we have, again, uh, similar to the hand, anastomoses um, in the, uh, or sort of right, right before, basically, the digits. They're not actually in the toes. It's in the, the metatarsals. OK, venous drainage and nervous supply. I've sort of grouped these in together um, because venous drainage is not very interesting and not very high yield. Um, so you can see on the, the plantar side, it's very, very married to the um, uh, the arteries, you can see they basically follow the same pattern with the lateral and, and medial plantar veins. Um, on the dorsal side, uh, it's a little bit more complex, but it's still the same basic ideas. We have a sort of a deep, a big arch, um, which then feeds back into the, excuse me, um, greater saphenous vein and lesser saphenous vein. So again, it's quite similar to the hand. Um, we have some paired um, arteries and veins to a significant degree. Um, and the primary drainage is still on the dorsal side. Okay, uh, in terms of nervous supply, so this is basically cutaneous innovation, looking at the, the sensory supply to the, the skin. Um, so on the dorsal side, it's primarily um, the 
the uh, superficial peroneal nerve. Uh, on the plantar side, it's um, primarily the tibial nerve, but the tibial nerve branches more before it actually goes in and innervates things. So the dorsal side is it, mostly just um, branches of the, the superficial peroneal nerve itself. Um, on the tibial side, it branches off first into the medial and lateral plantar nerves um, and the calcaneal branch as well. Uh, in terms of motor components, so primarily um, the deep fibular nerve um, supplies the, uh, the sort of, again, the intrinsic muscles of the, the dorsal foot. Um, and like I mentioned before, uh, the plantar um, compartment uh, is going to be mostly the lateral and medial plantar nerves, which are branches of the tibial nerve. Okie dokie. Um, so I think uh, with that, I can hand off to Raymond for viral pathogenesis. If you have any questions, feel free to chuck them in the chat as usual. Awesome. Uh, I think you need to give me share screening. Okay, right, good. sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, you should have it now. Awesome. People see that. Yep, uh, it's going black again, but it should be back in a sec. Yep, perfect. Sweet. All right. So I'll be talking about viral pathogenesis. And as we probably all gotten very used to, COVID is a virus. Um, and basically, a virus is an infectious agent that can only replicate in a host cell. And the features of a virus are that they're acellular and uh, acellular as in they have no cells and that's why they're often defined as non-living because in cell theory we assume that all living organisms come from um, pre-existing cells and as viruses don't have cells they're not counted as living however that's still up to debate um, they're obligate intracellular parasites as they require a host cell to replicate and undergo the functions of life and they lack a complete enzyme system and that's why they need to infect a cell to take over their enzyme system and in terms of their viral genome it's very small as in the size of it like the number of kilobits of actual nucleotides is very small however it has a really high gene density um, and in terms of its structure it's usually just a it's very basic it's usually just dna or rna coded in a protein in this image to the right we have it in a capsid Sometimes it's not, it's just a protein cover. And then you have, sometimes you have a protein outer uh, lipid envelope to cover it. And that's uh, in the case of COVID, it's studded with um, proteins on it that allow it to enter, um, inf uh, enter cells to infect. All right. Um, in terms of viral multiplication, so this is basically the process in which it gets into the cell and it replicates and it can be divided into five parts, attachment, penetration, replication, assembly, and release. In terms of attachment, this is how the cell infects the cell or gets into the cell. And basically it does this by um, attaching it to the host cell's surface uh, proteins. And it tricks the cell into thinking that it's a useful molecule that it wants to uptake via uh, endocytosis into the uh, cytoplasm. However, this is not what the cell actually wants, but um, the virus is very good at treating the cell. And in terms of examples of this, in terms of the HIV virus, it uses um, receptor proteins that are found on the surface of CD4 plus cells, that, such as the CCR5 and CXCR4 um, uh, glycoproteins. And in terms of COVID, it's the ACE, uh, in ACE2 receptor. And that's why um, if people know about the angiotensin system. That's why it has such um, vast effects over the body as the ACE2 receptor is found all over the body. Um, and then once it, it has attached, it needs to penetrate into the cell. And that's when it enters into the cell and begins shedding uh, its capsid. And then um, with that capsid, it either um, uses the its RNA or DNA to begin um, creating more versions of itself in the process of replication. And this is either by using, integrating itself into the host DNA and then creating mRNA or it already having mRNA and 
beginning the process of creating new versions of the cell. And then once it has created more versions of its mRNA and its uh, capsid proteins and so on, it then needs to um, combine together to form new virus particles. And that's in the process of assembly and it uses the Golgi apparatus of the host cell. And then they're released out of the cell either by exocytosis and the cell remains intact or it keeps using the cell to the point that it's deprived of all its usefulness and then the cell lyses and it spews out all of the virus particles to continue and uh, infect new cells. Um, viral pathogenesis is basically the adverse physiological consequences resulting from an infection and they can be divided into four things. Oncogenesis, cytopathy, immunopathology, and or asymptomatic. Um, in oncogenesis, basically, as cells are infected with viruses, they can alter um, they can alter the DNA of the cells either directly, such as in a retrovirus, where it actually integrates itself into the uh, host cells DNA, and that in that process there could be errors resulting in the activation of oncogenes or the inhibition of tumor suppressor genes or through repetitive damage to the cells and the need for replication and replacement of cells and the resulting in the buildup of genetic um, inconsistencies through the generations. Um, cyto cyto and cytopathy is basically the direct tissue damage. So that's just the production of new cells and the lysis of the cell as it Ex, uh, spews, spews out it's the viral particles and immunopathology is basically just inflammation caused by immune cells infiltrating to kill off viruses and the resulting resulting um, pathways of doing that are just cytokine and lymphocyte activation and this sometimes results in autoimmunity because as our body is really um, impressive at targeting um, pathogens, it also sometimes screws up that process. And in many cases, for example, in a cytotoxic T cell, it, it uses, um, uses uh, antibodies that are linked to the surface antigens that are found on the host cells. However, they've been slow, slightly altered due to the presence of the virus. And because of that, the body is able to create um, is able to identify that. However, sometimes it is so close to normal cells that it begins attacking the normal cells um, as well as the viral infected cells. And then also you have asymptomatic uh, consequences, and that is basically that there is no um, symptoms from it, as this is because the virus is latent or dormant. Example of this could be herpes zoster virus or the shingles virus, and it remains dormant in the cells genome for years until a certain um, disease weakens the immune system to the point that it is able to uh, reproduce and it's activated resulting in um, the symptoms of uh, shingles appearing. Um, and now we're gonna go on to virus classification. And there are two ways that our viruses can be classified either by the Baltimore classification or just on the basic uh, classifications on based on its um, shape or envelope or what type of nuclear acid that it has. Sometimes it's DNA, sometimes it's RNA, and or it's based on its morphology. And then in terms of the Baltimore classification, it's either can be known as a positive sense or a negative sense uh, bacteria or pot plus or minus RNA, and that's basically a plus means or positive means that the virus can directly begin replicating because it has, um, as we know with DNA, we have two copies. We have the positive and the negative. The positive one is the one that's actually used, whilst the negative one cannot, and it needs to be converted into the positive version. Um, in terms of, in, and that's why in the negative sense, RNA uh, bacteria, it needs to be converted into a positive sense strand before it can be used to uh, create more copies of itself. Um, and then we're just moving on to some examples. For example, uh, DNA viruses. And 
An example that you guys need to know is the herpes simplex virus. And it's basically a double-stranded DNA virus. Um, and there are two versions of it or two strains, the HSV1 and HSV2. And they result in oral herpes and general tool herpes, respectively. Um, and they basically establish latency in, a tr in the trigeminal or sacral ganglion. Um, and they result in lesions and watery blisters of the genitals of mouth. And basically they invade the immune system from actually destroying them by inactivating uh, the complement system. Um, in terms of the HPV virus, um, it's a non-enveloped circular double-strand DNA virus. There are two uh, strains of it, the alpha and beta, and they result in skin lesions or genital, uh, skin warts or genital warts. And basically they interfere with the RB and P53 proteins. And as we know, they're checkpoint proteins within the cell cycle process. And because of that, it can result in tumor, uh, tumor suppressive genes being active, uh, inactivated and oncogenes being activated. And that's why we have um, high levels of um, cervical cancers, as well as penile cancers, if you do not have immunization, which most people do have because uh, at least in Australia, due to the uh, immunization program that you undergo during high school. Um, and another one is hep C, which is a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. Um, and it's often from blood, it's a blood-borne virus and it's often transferred through IV drug use, tattoos, or invasive pro, uh, pro, uh, procedures. And it basically infects the liver resulting in an inflammatory response as it starts uh, lysing cells and breaking them down. And as such, your body starts to try and heal and protect itself through fibrosis and cirrhosis. And over time, your liver function uh, fails and you get uh, a cancer forming. And because it's an RNA virus, uh, and as we know, DNA is more is less susceptible to um, genetic mutations. RNA virus is more RNA DNA. Uh, no, RNA is just more susceptible to um, changes. Uh, we, that's why we have. Um, that's why it's more able to um, evade immune responses and evade uh, immune detection. And then next we have influenza. It's a negative sense single-stranded RNA virus. It results in upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract infections, it results in a cytokine storm, and it's an eight-piece genome bounded to an RNA polymerase complex. And it has an RNA polymerase complex as it needs to convert itself back into a positive sense uh, RNA. Therefore, it can actually be replicated within the cell. Ebola is another negative sense uh, RNA virus, and um, Ebola is super infectious, and it results in um, lytic. Um, that's why we don't have a massive spread of Ebola around the world, because it's so infectious that it results in most of its patients dying, as opposed to something like COVID, where most patients are able to survive and spread the disease onwards. Um, and now I think this is our last one, which is a retrovirus. Um, and basically a retrovirus is an RNA virus, which converts itself back into, uh, converts its RNA strand back into DNA, which is then integrated into the host DNA. To do this, you need uh, reverse transcriptase, which converts RNA back into DNA. Integrase, which uh, uses the um, DNA that has been, uh, the RNA which is converted back into DNA and integrates itself into the host DNA and protease which goes and chops up the host DNA so it can be then, um, so the new DNA can be spliced into the, integrated into the host DNA. Um, yeah, so HIV is a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, and it affects the CD4 cells uh, of the body as well as dendritic cells and osteoclast. And basically um, the host cells become HIV factories and 
over time, as um, more and more of the host um, CD4 cells become infected and are rendered useless once it's less than 400, um, I think milligrams per liter, or uh, there's some certain uh, value, um, they're basically counted as uh, having acquired immuno immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. And the best, luckily for most people, we are able to treat them with antiviral therapies right now. I think that is it for me. Thank you very much. Um, now we're gonna talk about infectious diseases, the skin and musculoskeletal um, system. So we're gonna start first by talking about the infectious diseases of the skin and talk how and where these diseases um, occur. So, um, there are three main can say, routes that uh, infectious diseases occur uh, on the skin. Uh, first of all, um, if there was breach of intact skin, if there was cut in your skin, um, surgery or burns, so that um, viruses or bacteria can enter um, your body and cause uh, the infections on your skin. Uh, the second way is the skin manifestation of systemic infection, uh, where you have you, you already have this um, um, pathogen in your body, and uh, because of its systemic infection, it can cause some infections in the skin. Some examples of this are the simplex uh, or salmonella and other viruses. Uh, finally, it's the toxin-mediated skin damage, where these pathogens um, release some toxins in your body, and these toxins can cause um, the infection on your skin. Some examples are scarlet fever and toxic uh, shock syndrome, which we will talk about um, in the coming slides. And where these infections occur, it, which part of the skin. Um, so it depends on the pathogen itself and um, the route that uh, uh, these pathogens enter your body. So um, it can happen in the hair follicles and proteinized uh, epithelium, in epiderms, in the derms, and uh, other parts of the skin. And these are some examples of these infectious diseases. Um, now we have some uh, terminology um, where these terms you come across or you might already know some of them. Uh, first of all, we have erythema, uh, which basically means uh, redness. If there is any redness in your skin, you can um, uh, scalp this redness as erythema. Uh, then we have macule, which is uh, a discoloration of the skin. It doesn't need to be red. Um, any other color, uh, like uh, not the color of your skin, and it has to be flat, so there are, uh, it's not elevated. Then we have the papule, which is same as macule, discoloration, uh, uh, circumscribed, but this time it, uh, it's elevated and it's less than one centimeter in diameter. Um, then we have vesicles, uh, which are small blisters with clear fluid, and they are highly contagious because this clear fluid has a lot of this pathogen of this virus or um, bacteria in it. So it's highly contagious. Then we have bulla, which is uh, a large 
blessa through it uh, larg alarga uh, same as physicals but uh, it's larga and then uh, we have uh, osteo uh, which is physicals or bulla but with cloudy fluid so bulla and physicals have uh, a clear fluid um, and we still have uh, cloudy fluid um, now we're going to talk about some examples of infectious uh, diseases of the skin and we're going to start by infections uh, first of all we have uh, cellulitis and uh, this disease caused by um, two types of bacteria so it can be caused by um, staphylococcus uh, aureus or by streptococcus uh, biogenesis biogenes sorry um, and we can say that most of the bacteria bacterial infections of the skin are caused by these two types um, of bacteria, uh, which you're gonna notice in the coming, uh, the other coming examples. So cellulitis um, involves uh, subcutaneous uh, tissue, and uh, some of the features of this uh, infection is that it can cause unilateral red, swollen, shiny lake, as you can see in this picture here and can also cause fever and it's treated with antibiotics then we have uh, toxic shock syndrome which is a very rare but life-threatening um, disease um, and it's also caused by the by the same two types of uh, bacteria uh, staphylococcus aureus or uh, streptococcus biogenesis um, and this syndrome can cause uh, super antigens where it can bind to T cells and uh, um, change their um, function or over uh, cause them to overdo their function. Um, this syndrome can cause discomitation of skin fever and multiple system failure. Uh, it can be treated by drainage, antibiotics, and fluid uh, replacement. Uh, another uh, bacterial <clears throat> infection disease <clears throat> called scaled uh, skin syndrome. It caused, it's caused by Staphylococcus uh, aureus, um, and it's really severely ill. It can, uh, some of its features that cause large areas of skin discomitation and blisters and it can be treated by antibiotics of, and fluid replacements. Um, then we have necrotizing uh, uh, fasciitis. I hope I'm going to yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty well, yeah. uh, fasciitis. Sorry, fasciitis. And uh, it's caused by Streptococcus biogenes. <clears throat> it can cause severe infection, uh, affects the skin, uh, fascia, and uh, soft tissue. Um, we can see in this picture, it can cause verbal skin necrosis and pain. And uh, in order to treat this infection, you need to remove this affected tissue. And it can also treat by antibiotics. Then we have uh, gas gangrene or uh, clostridial myonecrosis. Uh, it caused by clostridium uh, perfringis, fringens, and it causes rapid onset discoloration, blisters, and containing which contain uh, brown fluid, and it can uh, be treated with immediate surgery and antibiotics. Finally, we have scarlet fever, uh, which is which caused by uh, Streptococcus biogenesis, biogenes, um, where it caused punctate strawberry tongue and erythematous uh, rash and can be treated by antibiotics. Then we have these other examples of viral infections of the skin. Uh, first of all, we have chicken box, which caused by uh, Barcella zoster virus can be transmitted 
by uh, respiratory droplets or direct contact with skin lesions. Um, virtual is also virus um, can reactivate later, uh, especially with people who have um, or who are immunocompromised as herpes also, which can cause shingles. And uh, it can be treated by uh, acyclovir and there is an, uh, a vaccination for chickenpox. Also, there is vaccination available for shingles as well. Then we have uh, herpes sim simplex virus. We have uh, herpes uh, simplex virus one and two. Um, herpes simplex virus one can cause cold source and can be trans transmitted uh, via saliva. And uh, herpes simplex virus two um, can cause uh, genital blisters or ulcers and can be transmitted via sexual contact and it's also treated by the SI clover. Um, then we have slapped cheek, uh, which caused by parvovirus and caused red rash on cheeks and fever. Um, so I forgot to mention before that most of the infections uh, of this skin or musculoskeletal system are caused by either bacteria or um, viruses, but there are some infections that cause by fungus or uh, parasites as well. And here we have two examples of fungal infections. We have candida, which caused by candida albicans. Um, it's in the cutaneous mycosis. It can cause thrush, diaper rush, and or candida, uh, which, which can be treated with the uh, fluconazole or glutrimazole cream. And then we have uh, tinea, which goes by um, fungus called Malassezia furfa, um, which currently is superficial uh, mycosis and cause itchy red scalp rash, sweating, blood spots, um, scalp. Um, finally, we have uh, some uh, two examples of uh, bone and joint infections um, caused by bacteria. Um, one of them is uh, the osteomyelitis. Um, it's an infection in the bone that occurs uh, usually in the ends uh, of long uh, bones. Um, it can form a sequestrum, which is hard uh, to divide the lays. Uh, bones and they need to be surgically removed. It caused by Staphylococcus staphylo uh, aureus. And uh, so uh, th we can catch this um, bacteria and cause osteomyelitis by, uh, when we have an open fracture or it can be transferred infection from surrounding soft tissue. Um, it can be treated by treatment, drainage, and antibiotics. Then we have septic arthritis, um, which can cause red swollen joints and fever. Uh, and there's a prosthesis that can be the source of infection if we have um, some surgeries that involve prosthesis, then um, it can be the source of this infection. Uh, it requires medical uh, emergency, immediate antibiotics, and surgical drainage. And that's it for my part. Thank you so much. Lovely. Thanks, Marlon. So I'm up. We're doing hip and lower limb exam. Just let me, oh, James, you're going to have to permit me as well. Um, yeah, so we're doing hip and lower limb exam. Um, obviously, I'm not going to really be able to demonstrate a lot of it. Um, so definitely. Pay attention, attend to your ClinSkills tutorials. Um, I think Geeky Medics has pretty decent resources as well. Um, but mostly stick to your clinical skills booklet. Um, it really is like, it has everything that you need and basically everything I've um, written up here. When I'm unsure about something 
that I'm supposed to be talking about, I'm going, okay, well, I need to check the clinical skills booklet because that's what you need to actually know. Um, let me just optimize the video clip and present. All right. So a lot of this is also recycled. I mean, uh, the uh, stuff that isn't in orange is recycled from my MSK exam overview slides that I did a little while ago. Um, okay, so orange is the new low limb stuff, but this is sort of just generally important. So returning to our understand, uh, understood structure of examination, it comes after a history and before we start going, okay, well, what tests do we need to send out if we're not sure? And finally finding a patient's diagnosis. Um, the main things I wanna draw focus to are that history is very relevant um, because knowing the mechanism of how um, the patient was injured uh, is going to very deeply inform uh, your differential diagnoses. So what you actually think it could be. Um, all right. Uh, and another thing is just uh, while I'm going to go through sort of introduction, general appearance, and then inspection, palpation, movements, measurements, special tests, um, and then I'll sort of go through the regions. When you're doing it in practice, you really want to be looking at one region, then move on to the next region, rather than sort of looking at the hip, then looking at the knee, then looking at the foot, then returning to the hip to feel, um, and so on and so forth. It's, it's much less jarring um, to do it by region and also by where you actually have to position the patient. All right, um, so intro, pretty straightforward. Um, making sure that you're doing your high hand hygiene, specifically for lower limb exam, obviously you're gonna need full exposure of the legs. So the recommendation usually is patient in underpants. Although if they're really uncomfortable about it, then maybe you can do shorts. It's just, that's gonna inhibit your ability to um, inspect the hip, especially, and the thigh, the upper leg. Um, all right. And, and obviously um, if the patient's in any pain or discomfort, if they think that they've injured something and you don't want to be messing around with it, all right, general appearance. Key idea here um, is just observing what seems to be going on with the patient at the very beginning. Um, if they have crutches or something like that, then, or, or a, a moon boot, um, I can't think of the correct term for that, but um, something that is, is helping them. Um, maybe they have prosthetics, maybe they only have one limb. Those sorts of things are obviously very relevant to your lower limb exam. So um, yeah. All right, in terms of inspection, so that's our looking at the specific region. Um, really, you wanna be looking for lots of skin signs, swelling, muscle changes, um, deformities, uh, dislocations, and especially for lower limb, we wanna be looking at um, gait. So that's the way that someone walks. Um, and you can see here, I've sort of got it divided into hips, knees, and ankle or foot. Um, I will return to these because I have also, um, for instance, all of the details of hips in a specific hip slide, and that's where I'll sort of talk through it a bit more. Um, but yeah, make sure that you're comparing sides as well. Um, the recommendation when a patient is walking, which is sort of the beginning of your examination, um, your lower limb exam, is to look at their lowest joint and then move up as you're observing their gait. Um, so seeing how for instance, if they have a sore ankle, how that would be changing how they're walking, um, et cetera. All right, uh, palpations, that's our feeling. Um, we wanna start gentle and then go firm as per usual. All of these crazy bony landmarks that we should be palpating. Um, the mnemonic BEST is quite useful for just thinking about what we should be looking for. So we've got bony landmarks, um, then we've got sort of effusion, so that's fluid collection, collecting. Um, Swelling, which can also be fluid collecting. Um, tenderness, so that's pain on palpation. Um, and temperature, which you feel with the back of your hand. Yep, so you go through that with the different regions and I'll talk through it a little bit more. Um, you can see here that the ischial tuberosity, which is sort of the, the, your butt bones, the bones you sit on, um, and your pubic tubercle, which is up uh, near the front, uh, near, near your genitals. Um, you don't actually, in, a, in an exam at our level, you don't want to actually be inspecting those um, because of patient comfort and the expertise that we have. Um, so you'd mentioned that you would examine them, but um, in, an, in an OSCE sort of setting, you wouldn't actually 
examine it at uh, year one level. All right. Uh, in terms of movement, so that's our third step. Um, we're remembering to compare sides once again. Um, initially, we start with an active movement and then we go to passive. Um, so we want the patient to move first, then we move their joint. Um, and sometimes we'll need to be stabilizing. Um, for instance, we want to stabilize the patient's hip when we're doing hip flexion and hip extension, um, because otherwise they could sort of start articulating their lower back. And you want to check just the mobility of that specific joint that you're examining, which is why we stabilize. Similar to, you know, stabilizing the shoulder um, and seeing how much we can move their arm, um, their shoulder joint, how much we can abduct or adduct it. Mostly abduct in that example. Um, and noting very importantly, if they've had a recent injury, you don't want to be messing with it. So don't passively move a joint if it's recently been injured. Sort of makes sense. Uh, first medical tenant, uh, non non maleficence, very important. Um, okay, checking how stable the joint is, and that sort of relates to dislocation or subluxation and crepitus. So when you're feeling um, the joint, make sure that you're noting whether you um, notice or feel sort of a grating or crackling feeling generally, or potentially sound, um, which can indicate. Uh, wearing of the cartilage. Okay, measuring. So really there's only one sort of measuring that we specifically do um, in the leg exam that is like specific for lower limb exam. Um, and that's leg length, measuring both the true and the apparent leg length. Um, but also remembering that you can sort of approximate the range of movement, um, sorry, the range of movement in terms of the range of motion in terms of the degrees. Um, and also if, for instance, there seems to be muscle wasting, then you could measure um, the muscle bulk and then check in a couple of times and see, oh, does it seem like they're, they're, they're wasting more and more. Um, when we're looking at leg length, um, generally we group it with the hip, um, but true length are abnormalities. So being different lengths, um, substantially different lengths, that could be due to really anywhere in the lower limb, right? Anywhere inside the leg could be, could have something going on that is contributing to that leg being longer or shorter than the other one. Um, so the true leg length, the way that we measure that is from the anterior superior iliac spine, which is that front sort of uh, bony prominence on your pelvis um, to the medial malleolus. Um, and that's the inner ankle sort of hammer shaped bit. Um, that's what malle malleolus is derived from, like a mallet. Making sure that you're comparing size, because otherwise, how are you going to know if they're different lengths? Um, and then the apparent leg length, uh, we measure the from the umbilicus, so that's the navel or the belly button, so the same medial malleolus. Um, and we're comparing again. So with true leg length, that can vary for... Um, reasons that the leg is actually shorter, and that can be for joint or bone reasons. Um, whereas with apparent leg length, that's more likely due to some sort of hip tilt. Um, and that might be due to scoliosis, for example. Okay, our final part of examination is special tests. So I'm sure you're familiar with some of them from upper limb now at this point. Um, but with lower limb, we've got quite a few, especially for the knee, and I'll go through them uh, shortly. But uh, an example here we've got is the Trendelenburg test. So that's when we have the patient stand on one leg um, unassisted, unless it seems like they're going to fall over, then obviously make sure that you're assisting them or if they feel like they might fall over. But you have them stand on one leg and raise the one leg off the floor. Um, with a bent sort of knee in front. And you'll notice usually someone's hips will stay level or the leg that they've lifted um, off the ground will sort of rise slightly. But if it dips um, below the hip that is the of the supporting leg, then that indicates that this these muscles, the glute medius and the gluteus minimus, um, which are the hip abductors, uh, are weak, 
And that can be, I think, for a couple of reasons. But basically, yeah, that positive sign is that tilting down on the, um, the unaffected side, but the tilting down of the lifted leg. Um, and that shows weakness of the contra, so opposite lateral, so other side, contralateral, gluteus medius and minimus, those hip abductors. All right, I'll talk through um, the specific stuff of each uh, region now. So yeah, we're at hips. That's probably where we'll start, right? Working prox uh, yeah, proximally to distally. Um, so first we have the patient standing. We walk with them, we watch them turn, we see if there are any sort of abnormalities and that can be for a range of different pathologies. Please refer to your clinical skills book and your clinical skills tutor. Um, they are gold mines. Uh, the clinical skills book captures everything. I've just tried to summarize this in a brief way. Um, okay, then you do the Trendelenburg test of, as I've spoken about and shortening posture of leg. Um, so yeah, even in look, you can see we're sort of doing the Trendelenburg, but that's really the reason that we're grouping it there is because um, the patient's standing, they've just done gait, and we want to do that before we have them lie down and do all of the feeling. All right. Um, when we're feeling, we're feeling, uh, for instance, the anterior superior iliac spine, the posterior superior iliac spine, and you're going, well, Kyle, those are on the front and back of the patient. How are we doing that? Well, we've had the patient lie down on the examination bed, and then we've had them lie on their side. So that we have them lie on one side, we look at all of their anterior, um, or we feel all of their anterior hip stuff, um, their bony landmarks, and then we have them turn away from us, and then we do the same. Um, if we were to do the ischial tuberosity, for example. Um, but most of this we can uh, palpate from, from the anterior. Anyway. Um, okay, then we move the patient. So we, uh, well, we have them move and then we move them. Um, we've got extension and flexion, and I'm glad I didn't put a degree measurement in for flexion, but generally you can sort of think of what is the, the reasonable range of motion of flexing our hip. Um, but obviously with extension, if they're lying down um, on their back, so supine, then they're not going to be able to extend their leg backwards, right? Extend uh, their hip joint. So you're going to have to have them lie prone for a little bit to do the extension. And I think a couple other tests, and I'll talk through that in a minute. Um, and then the rest of the movements you can do with the patient lying on their back. So um, supine. I think I said that right. So prone for extension and then supine for basically all of the other movements. Um, then we measure leg length as I spoke about earlier and we do the Thomas test. And I think, yep, I've got the Thomas test here. So that's where we have the patient um, lying on the examination bed, their knee hanging off. And we want them to keep their hip flat and we have them pull their leg uh, forwards. Uh, so flexing the hip joint. And what we want to see is that the, uh, the contralateral leg, so the other leg, uh, staying sort of flush with the examination bed. Um, if the uh, other leg that they aren't pulling lifts up, then that indicates a fl fixed flexion deformity. So that's potentially... Um, the, the a restricted rectus femoris muscle as indicated by this diagram. So you can see here, this is the positive sign, the abnormal, and this is the normal uh, negative sign. All right, then we're on to the knees. So we've got gait once again, um, because if they're walking around and they have a really sore knee, they're probably not going to be want to put much weight on it. They might be sort of changing how they're walking. Then we have genuvarus, varus, or valgus, ah, oh, Latin, scary. Um, so genu meaning knee, and various or valgus sort of referring to whether the knees are bow-legged. So um, sort of like uh, if someone's standing like this, they're out, or if they're knock knees, so sort of pigeon toes, so sort of the um, that that meme. Um, so the way that I remember various versus valgus. Um, is that I thought sort of think of the R, that's sort of that curve um, to the R. And so it's sort of curved out, bow-legged, whereas um, 
sort of have knock knees is sort of that L, which I think of like a capital L and two capital L's sort of um, knocking into one another. So you can imagine sort of their knees knocking in like that. <laughs> I hope that explains it. If, uh, just have a quick Google search um, if, if that's still unfamiliar. Um, a baker's cyst as well, you want to observe. Um, so that's a, a popliteal cyst, which I think is fluid from the, the knee joint um, that is collected sort of in the popliteal fossa, the posterior aspect of your knee. Then we feel. So once again, we've got the patient lying down at this point. We don't want them standing and us sort of like kneeling at them and awkwardly feeling their knee. No, we have them lie down on the examination bed. Um, we do the bony landmarks, effusions, swelling, uh, tenderness and temperature. Um, as we as we did with the hip joint as well. Um, but here we wanna be feeling uh, along the joints, the tibial tuberosity borders of the patella. So that's your kneecap, um, the insertion of the hamstrings, or the insertions, um, the borders of the quadriceps muscle, muscles, uh, the femoral condyles, and also popliteal pus you can feel there as well. So that's feeling. Um, then we move on to moving. So we wanna see them flex and extend their knee and they can do that by, by flexing their hip joint, right? They can keep their knee um, high up enough in the air while they are lying supine, so on their back to do flexion and extension. So you don't need them turning around um, lying on their tummy prone um, for the knee movements. You can just have them lying on their back. Um, and then we wanna do tests and I will go through them now. All right, there's a lot of them. Okay, but this sort of makes sense. So patella tap, you're tapping the, the patella. Um, and if there's a lot of fluid that's circulated out, then you'll actually be able to feel the patella will sort of be like floating on that fluid, right? And so it'll bounce um, and that will indicate a larger fusion. Um, a smaller fusion, you do the bulge sign, which is that pushing laterally of the um, patella and seeing if a bulge uh, is present. And then the apprehension test is similar to what you might remember the shoulder apprehension test from uh, upper limb. So that's uh, where sort of laterally moving their patella. Um, and the idea is that if they feel uh, instability there, then that probably indicates the risk or the potential that they've dislocated or subluxed their patella. Um, subluxation being when the connection is still there, dislocation when there is, is no longer any contact between the both. All right, we're done testing the patella. Now we're testing the ligaments of the knee. You've got four ligaments of the knee. Um, you've got the two cruciate ligaments, which are sort of the central ones. Um, and then you've got the, the um, collateral ligaments. So I don't know why I ordered it that way because we're talking about the collateral ligaments first. Um, so we've got the valgus and the varus stress tests, which you might remember from us talking about genu varus and valgus um, a minute ago. So that valgus, that knock knees, the L, capital L, meaning the knock knees, um, that's when we're testing the medial collateral ligament, which if you think about it, uh, that makes sense because when it's going in that way, we're going to be flat, um, sort of stressing the medial collateral ligament, the, the ligament that is on the lateral side of the knee. Um, we're going to be stressing that when we're doing it. Um, so we're testing the integrity of that. Um, and uh, uh, complementarily, we're doing the varus test to test the lateral collateral ligament. Relatively straightforward. Um, then we are testing the ACL, which is I'm pretty sure the most damaged the sort of knee ligament. Um, hear it a lot in sort of sporting injuries, dance injuries, that sort of thing. Um, so the anterior cruciate ligament, we can test in a couple of ways. Um, we've got the anterior draw test, um, which is sort of, you've got your hands on the patient's uh, knee. So you've got your thumbs on their knee and then you're pulling back, right? And so when you're sort of like you're opening a drawer and that will test the anterior cruciate ligament. And then if you're like closing the door, then um, that's testing the posterior cruciate ligament. And then another test for the anterior cruciate ligament is the Lachman test here, um, which I think is more, um, more accurate than the anterior draw test. Um, and that's sort of this similar 
forwards pulling motion and seeing an abnormality if there's more than a certain amount of mobility in that joint. Okay, and then we've got the menisci. So those, that's sort of that um, cartilaginous cushioning in the knee joint, whether there's been some damage there. Um, and really the main one that we need to know um, is McMurray, but we've also got Apley's and Thessaly's here. Um, but yeah, the McMurray's test is pretty aptly demonstrated here. Um, you're internally rotating the foot, applying varus stress, so that outwards stress, um, and then you're also slowly extending the patient's knee. And if they feel pain, um, then that's indicative, that's a positive sign of the lateral meniscus being damaged or torn or something. Um, and then we've got Apley's compression test um, and the Thessaly test, which do similar things, basically putting stress on those menisci to test them. Um, wonderful. All right, and then we've got test for ankle and foot. So it's really just one, the Achilles tendon integrity or the Thompson test, um, which you might remember uh, James a little bit ago, hour ago now, um, was talking about um, Ach an Achilles tendon here. That's a very important tendon. Um, it allows that plantar flexion of the foot through the contraction of, I'm pretty sure gastrocnemius and maybe soleus as well, these muscles of the calf. Um, and so they pull on that tendon and that put and that causes the foot to plantar flex. So what you can do, and you can test it on yourself, you just sort of um, squeeze the calf and we should be getting some plantar flexion of the foot. And when we're not, you can imagine that's pretty mechanically straightforward. Um, it's you're pulling on one end of the cable, but there's a break somewhere along that cable that's Achilles tendon. And so it's not continuing to pull. It's just, there's some tear here. So that indicates an Achilles tendon uh, tear or rupture. All right. And then talking through the ankle and foot um, here, we've just got um, the things that we're looking for here. I don't know why I put the ankle and foot test before the ankle and foot examination. Apologies. All right. Um, I'll fix that later. But yeah, so we're looking once again for similar stuff, um, although also hallux, hallux valgus, which is, um, I'm pretty sure it's the developing of a uh, sort of extra bony prominence on the medial aspect of the big toe. Um, and I encourage you to Google, the, Google search that image because apparently it's like one of the most common um, deformities that you get with the foot. Um, you've also got flat foot, like, uh, like James was talking about um, with, sorry, falling off the wagon a bit, um, like James was talking about with the sort of loss of that arch um, and other sort of changes um, that you sort of expect to go, oh, okay, that's abnormal. We're going to note that. Um, feeling, once again, these sorts of key um, aspects of the foot, including all of the joints, making sure that they aren't tender, et cetera, um, and then moving them uh, first active, then passive. Um, and you shouldn't have a bunch of range of movement with eversion or inversion, um, and testing the interphalangeal joints. So as you would test with the fingers, testing the toes, and then you do the test for the Achilles tendon integrity. And here's a really brief summary that I tried to sort of convey in terms of positioning. So it makes sense. You don't want to sort of have the patient having to stand up, then lie down, then turn around, then turn around, then stand up, then lie down, then sit up and do something, right? You just want them to have to stand up for one time. You do all of the tests that are needed standing. Then you have them lie down um, prone. You have the, them test a couple of things and then you have them lie supine and you do that. You don't, yeah. So basically you want to minimize sort of the amount of movements that the patient is having to do. Um, and that'll mean that your examination will go more fluidly as well. So I've got a summary here, um, but most of the things are done sort of supine lying on the examination bed, but you've got some things done standing as we spoke through, and then also some things on the side um, when they're lying on their side and a couple things, for instance, the tendon integrity um, and uh, their posterior hip extension, because you can't do that movement while you're lying on your back, um, prone. All right, thank you so much. Um, and then you summarize uh, to the patient, thank them, ask them to dress. Also, 
ideally offer them like a blanket um to to cover their legs when you're not specifically examining for instance their hips um because being in underwear is always uh, maybe a little bit sensitive all right and then hand hygiene thank you <laughs> so much sorry it took a minute um yeah thank you kyle um and now we're going to talk about adult development a little bit a little bit of uh shell sd um so being adult like a huge part of being adult is about um relationships um with others it can be either friendships or uh a higher level of friendship it can be some romantic uh, relationships. So we have three themes um, of friendships. Um, so the first one is the affective or emotional theme, where uh, it's about the expressions of intimacy, appreciation, support, and um, it requires trust and commitment from both sides. Uh, the second theme is the shared or communal nature. It's about uh, mutual interests and finally uh, sociability and comparability uh, which is about fun and entertain entertainment sorry um and we have five stages of friendship um development you can remove them by a b c d d so the first stage is uh, acquaintanceship uh, which is about getting to know each other. Um, and then the second stage is to build, to build up this connection or this uh, relationship. Um, third stage is continuation of this um, relationship. Then you might get some barriers in this relationship. So it's de deterioration and finally ending the relationship or the friendship. Um, and according to Sternberg, uh, there are three uh, components of love, passion, intimacy, and uh, commitment. Commitment. Um, they found that uh, couples are happier when each feels the same type of love uh, to a similar degree towards each other. And they found also that longer relationships have lower intimacy and passion, but um, greater commitment uh, between the two sides. So um, love through adulthood can be divided into two types. Well, yeah. So uh, we have the first is the infatuation, um, where they have um, but lower commitment. And so in this type of um, love relationships, um, the divorce is, uh, the, the, the rates of divorce are much higher. However, in the uh, second type, is the assortative, uh, assortative um, mating, uh, which is selecting one spot based on similarity across many dimensions. So they have greater commitment in this of uh, uh, love and uh, actually I found a study which is pretty interesting uh, it said that um, the person uh, that you like his or her uh, smell is the um, person you likely can spend um, your life together with because they found like when you like someone's smell, natural uh, smell, um, they say it, uh, your genetic is complement with him or her, and uh, like uh, it's not too different from her or him, and it's not too similar. So they found that this relationship based on um, persons you like, uh, the smell of this person are longer. Um, and here we have some statistics about uh, marriage in Australia. So half 
of Australians who are 15 years or older are married. And the, we have here the difference between the median age of first marriage between 1975 and 2016. Um, so uh, generally we can see that um, the, the median age uh, at first marriage are getting like higher or older. Um, also marriage uh, preceded by cohabitation. Um, so in 1976, there were 16% of these marriages that preceded by uh, cohabitation. However, in 2016, 81% uh, of marriages were preceded by cohabitation. Um, the likelihood uh, marriages are uh, more likely to succeed when both uh, partners are relatively mature. Uh, they have similar values, interests, and uh, they contribute equally in this um, and equitably in this relationship and uh, finally when they are honest and committed and here we have some statistics about the divorce in australia so third uh, of the marriages uh, in australia in, in divorce um, however uh, divorce rates are declining and uh, marriages um, a longer in duration, median age of uh, males and females getting um, um, divorced. So males are when they are at 45, females when they are at uh, 43. Um, and we have lots of reasons uh, for divorce, it might be communication problems, unhappiness, incompatibility. Um, which is the top, these three reasons are the top for females and, and males. Um, it might be because of alcohol abuse uh, by males, physical abuse towards women and women's liberation um, is also notable. Um, there are lots of impacts of divorce, it can be financial um, impacts, um, mental uh, impact, it, uh, these impacts can, or it will impact the children if these um, couples have children. So um, if the um, couples were, were conflict and in bit uh, parenting, so it can cause stressful and increased risk for children. Um, if they were competent uh, parents, organize contact with non-resident parent, uh, it can be protective and uh, there is increased risk of mental illness. However, 80% uh, of uh, children are well adjusted. Um, and lots of marriage relationships um, connect more by having uh, children. So um, the age of having a uh, first child is between 30 and 34 uh, years old for both males and females. And uh, the decision of having children, of course, when couples feel ready and positive about uh, being uh, a parent, third of couples uh, with the uh, third of couples uh, have dependent children, a third of couples uh, they have no children, and one out of ten uh, single parents uh, do have dependent children. Um, so, returning uh, to work after a baby, um, there are financial needs, care for children, connection to work. Uh, in Australia, they offer uh, leave base up to 18 weeks. Uh, and there are some concerns about career progression is justified. Um, and in violence, uh, family violence in Victoria is increasing and more cases have charged uh, late disclosure of intimate pa uh, partner violence in Australia in our practice. Um, they found that women in violent relationship report elevated physical issues, emotional uh, problems like depression and anxiety. Uh, and women uh, present to domestic violent, uh, violence services. Um, 
often report violence in previous relationships. 43% uh, reported to the GB and third reported to self-medication. And the aggressive behavior, um, the causes of uh, uh, this aggressive behavior um, increases as, as the severity of this uh, aggressive behavior increases as well. So um, you have verbal abuse, physical abuse, severe physical abuse, and finally murder. Um, and part of uh, adult development, we have a career. Uh, it serves many purpose, uh, purposes, like earning a living, meaning, fulfillment, prestige, and identity. Uh, we have two theories here, Holland's theory and uh, social cognitive career theory, which is Bendora theory. Um, according to Holland's theory, people uh, pursue careers that are a good fit between personality, ability, and interests. Um, and in Pandora theory, self-efficacy, uh, perceived ability, outcome, expectation, interest, choice, goal, support, and barriers. Uh, this um, all things affect uh, the career. And we have occupation as well. So uh, occupational expectations are influenced by the surrounded uh, environment, um, the goals of incubation may be refined or abandoned, and the uh, it's about talent and opportunity or associated with achievement uh, of goals. Loss of incubation um, have some impacts, like where it can be worse during middle age for males and those uh, less educated. It can put some mental stress um, on these adults and uh, even can cause increased risk of suicide. Finally, we have leisure. Um, so it's uh, it's related to being uh, discretionary uh, activities. Um, adults um, often go to leisure to reduce stress, improve social relationships, um, and uh, the choice um, of type of leisure is directed by competence, ability to meet personal goals, health, income, transport, and education. And um, the engagement and preference stable uh, over time, but in young adults, they prefer more intense and broad uh, activities uh, during leisure. However, middle, middle age um, adults prefer leisure in home, And now I'll have to cut again. You're muted. I didn't realize I was not. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. I didn't realize I was muted. Okay, Jackie. Um, so a couple. Um, on gender development and sexuality. Um, let's get into it. All right, so general, most important idea, if there's anything that you're gonna take away from what I'm saying right now, um, that it's, it's to use inclusive language, to give your own pronouns. So my pronouns are he, him, for example, um, ask for uh, others' pronouns, patients' pronouns, um, or note them if they're on an intake form um, and use them. So use their preferred name and pronouns. Uh, so some key distinctions here, gender is a sociocultural construct. So um, it's one's own understanding, sense, uh, their identity of being uh, masculine, feminine, non-binary, um, gender fluid, things like that. Um, in terms of uh, sex, in a medical sense, what we're talking about is the biology of being male or female or intersex. Um, so that's predominantly to do with chromosomes, um, and secondarily, a little bit to do with genitalia, but really to do with chromosomes. Um, and then in terms of sexuality, uh, I mean, that's that's relatively straightforward. Um, so that's sexual orientation, gay, straight, bi, pan, um, asexual, et cetera. Um, yeah, uh, so that's the one's identity regarding the genders that they are attracted to. 
Um, all right, and then when we're talking about um, being trans, transgender. Um, so transgender refers to uh, the situation when someone's sex assigned at birth um, does not correspond with their gender identity. Um, so there's an incongruence there, and that can um, manifest itself as gender dysphoria. So that's uh, distress that someone is getting from that mismatch um, between how they identify and the body uh, biologically that they are within. Um, and so there are different things that we can do to affirm the gender, um, which is the, the way to uh, alleviate this gender dysphoria. Um, so uh, in sort of looking in, um, uh, with, uh, transgender child children, then um, we're looking at focusing on what they say about their identity um, and expression and allowing them to determine uh, what forms of gendered expression feel comfortable and authentic and right to them. Um, and there's also the, so one of the main things that you can do obviously is transition, um, and that can be hormonally, surgically, um, things like that. Um, but there's um, obviously you, you don't want to do that too early. Um, there's, there's the risk of, um, I don't know, that's, that's borderline transphobic wasn't intended to be. Um, what I mean here is that, uh, there is this concept of delaying transition. Um, and the aims of that are actually to reduce the risk of stigma and bullying and to uh, account for change of mind, uh, if, if that were to happen. Um, but obviously there are caveats to that and problems with that, it's particularly um, the fact that you are subjecting the trans person to dysphoria um, and potentially much more dysphoria than is necessary if you'd enabled them to transition earlier. Um, also, obviously there can be transitioning that isn't just hormonal or surgical, but is more so in terms of uh, how you're expressing your gender. Um, but generally you wanna affirm someone's gender. Um, and then trans, Transitioning, yeah, we, is what I was just talking about. So um, the umbrella term for steps that someone who's trans um, and their community can take to affirm their gender identity. And so that can include, include social, medical, surgical, and legal changes. Um, for instance, name changes, uh, things like that. Um, and however, in children, the main focus is around social transitioning. So I'm sorry, this bar is there. Um, it, the main focus is around social transitioning. So. Um, before they can sort of surgically transition um, or hormonally, medically. Um, so changing how you're expressing your gender um, in, in those social contexts. All right, very important. Um, use people's pronouns, lots of love, thank you. All right. Um... Our final topic for today, outbreak investigation. And we have here a little bit of terminology. Um, so we have a definition of epidemic, which um, um, when there are more cases than expected in a specific uh, area, um, outbreak is the same as epidemic. Um, and it may be smaller number of cases uh, pandemic is epidemic, but not in specific area. It's in the whole uh, world. We have uh, endemic, it's, which is permanent or regular disease incidence. Um, um, and uh, how outbreak, uh, how does outbreak uh, occur? Um, can occur you, uh, through new appearance of an infectious a agent or toxic material from the environment or from an infected source, uh, uh, the arrival of susceptible uh, people to safe environment without this pathogen can cause also uh, outbreak, uh, the introduction of effective route of transmission from source to susceptible source can cause um, outbreaks. So why do we need to do an outbreak investigation? Um, it has to do um, for the, um, to contaminate 
this um, out outbreak. Uh, so we need to firstly identify the pathogen or the source of this outbreak, uh, control the cases, prevent future outbreaks, learn, learn about the disease and um, do some training opportunities. A decision based on case numbers, disease severity and risk um, to others, uh, besides public or legal concerns. We have 10 steps uh, in order to make an um, outbreak investigation. The first step is to prepare for field uh, work. Um, the knowledge about this uh, um, epidemiological um, situation, uh, supplies and equipment we need, team composition, administrative, and um, some personal preparation. The second step is to verify the existence um, of outbreak. Um, so define as more cases than usual. What is the, the usual? Um, and must be specific, both community origin and with associated with the time. Uh, then we have surveillance, which is monitoring uh, of disease in population. And there are different types of surveillance um, you can see through this um, table here. Um, sorry. So, to uh, part of verifying the existence of outbreak is the to to verify the sources um, of information. It might be surveillance records, I mean, through clinicians and laboratories, childcare centers, schools, or random members um, of the public. Um, there are some causes uh, of false alarm, uh, for example, change in surveillance uh, policy of uh, reporting um, to, and improved diagnosis uh, if there are new tests or increased GP awareness. Um, can, uh, false positives where all diagnostic tests have uh, some error, increased public awareness and increased reporting. The third step is to confirm the diagnosis, is to review the clinical uh, findings, uh, the laboratory uh, results, and to be uh, as specific as possible about the causative um, agent to determine uh, is it bacteria or is it virus. Um, and to talk to cases, uh, final reference, uh, the laboratories. Um, also, you, you need to define the cases, um, the sensitivity and specificity, um, compo uh, components of this, including clinical features, uh, place, time period of interest, and lab results. Uh, it can, these cases can be divided into confirmed, probable, and possible cases. Um, also, apart from identifying uh, cases um, is case finding. So to use as many sources as possible, other alert the public and ask, ask cases to identify themselves and identify people in place of interest at time of potential exposure and directly contact them. So you can control uh, the number of cases and control the outbreak. The fifth step is to describe uh, and orient your data. So um, to draw, for example, an epidemic curve, number of cases um, and time, uh, do some graphs, uh, place, map the data, where, where are these uh, cases, and finally person, where you need to explore data according to personal characteristics. Uh, the uh, sixth and seventh and eighth steps is to develop, evaluate, and refine uh, your hypothesis by doing uh, additional studies. Uh, so for example, what is the source of infection? Which study type you, you're gonna use? Um, um, what results you, you, you are looking for? In the ninth step uh, is to implement and control and prevent uh, prevention measures. So once source of outbreak has been identified, um, you aim to break links of chain of infection to contaminate 
um, uh, so, for example, remove contaminated food, sterilize contaminated water. Um, this days, COVID-19 um, outbreak, for example, we have you need to wear masks. Uh, social, we have social distancing. Uh, people with this uh, virus need to be in quarantine for two weeks, for example. And finally, the last step is to uh, communicate your findings. So must go through outbreak investigation, investigation team, uh, prepare timely reports, initial oral briefing, um, written reports, publications, and uh, some state facts. Um, and the aim of this is to improve the practice. Um, that's it for today. Thank you so much. Awesome. So thank you to Marwan um, and to you guys for sticking around. Uh, we, we started late today, so obviously we went a bit over time. But yeah, um, the recording will be up on YouTube soon. And yeah, see you guys next week. <laughs>